Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Marcus, and I am a practicing allergist and pulmonologist at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Severe asthma is a complex disease where multiple inflammatory pathways can be activated, leading to various clinical manifestations, such as wheezing, cough, and shortness of breath, among others. Historically, we've looked at what downstream pathways are activated through biomarkers, like bloody eosinophils, IgE, and pheno. More recently, it's been discovered that thymic stromal lymphopoietin, or TSLP, can also play a key role in severe asthma. Patients with severe asthma can have multiple environmental triggers, and the airway epithelium is the first point of contact for these triggers. We also now know that thymic stromal lymphopoietin, or TSLP, is released by the epithelium as a response to external triggers. TSLP impacts IL-5, IL-13, and IL-4, as well as the mast cell. It initiates at the top and perpetuates throughout the cascade, contributing to two key hallmarks of asthma, airway inflammation and airway hyperresponsiveness. Airway inflammation and airway hyperresponsiveness, also referred to as simply twitchy airways, are prominent clinical manifestations that occur in most, if not all, severe asthma patients. At its most basic level, Airway inflammation is both chronic and persistent. It can result in worsening asthma symptoms in patients and can also lead to thickening of the airway walls, narrowing of the airways, and increased mucus production. In addition to resulting in the aforementioned clinical manifestations, airway inflammation can also lead to frequent asthma exacerbations, as well as reduced lung function over time. Increased mucus production caused by airway inflammation can also contribute to the formation of mucus plugs in the airway, which can result in airway occlusion. Historically, the role of mucus plugs has been associated with fatal asthma. However, our clinical understanding of mucus plugs is evolving, and we now see that they may be present and persistent in chronic severe asthma. So what is a mucus plug exactly? As I touched on earlier, Mucus plugs occur when airway inflammation leads to alterations in the volume, composition, and properties of the mucus plug being produced. These instances combine in various degrees to form abnormal or pathologic mucus. Pathologic mucus is not easily cleared by the cilia and can build up in the airway leading to mucus accumulation and mucus plugging. As you can see on screen, the type 2 cytokines, IL-13 and IL-5, initiate multiple pathways that are involved in the formation of mucus plugs in the lungs. Mucus plugging can lead to airflow obstruction, which can contribute to reduced lung function and an increased risk of severe asthma attacks. Recent advancements in our understanding of the role of mucus plugs play in chronic asthma is in part due to studies performed by the NIH-funded Severe Asthma Research Program, SARP. SARP performed chest CT scans of patients enrolled and identified mucus plugs within the airways of 68% of the severe asthmatic study. 82% of patients with mucus plugs at baseline still had evidence of mucus plugs at year three despite standard of care in a subset of participants. Patients with persistent mucus plugs were more likely to have airflow limitation, diminished lung function, a greater number of exacerbations, or more likely to have elevated blood eosinophils and pheno, and require chronic oral corticosteroids compared to those without mucus plugs. This study suggests that changes in mucus scores represent a potential link between mucus plugging and chronic airflow obstruction in asthma. In addition to airway inflammation, Another key hallmark of severe asthma is airway hyperresponsiveness, or AHR. AHR is an excessive narrowing of the airways, or bronchoconstriction, in response to asthma triggers. Looking back to the inflammatory cascade, when TSLP is activated by external triggers, mast cells are release a variety of mediators, including histamine, leukotrienes, and various cytokines that can cause airway inflammation and bronchoconstriction. In those with severe asthma, this can lead to an exaggerated response to triggers and contribute to further airway hyperresponsiveness, perpetuating the cycle of their disease. Though it's not just the activation of mast cells, 
multiple factors are associated with AHR and severe asthma. The enhanced production of cytokines, which can be driven by TSLP, contribute to worsening AHR. In addition, the severity of patients' AHR correlates with key biomarker levels, such as eosinophils and pheno. Airway inflammation, remodeling, and structural changes can contribute to AHR severity. In review, we've talked through two key hallmarks of asthma, airway inflammation and airway hyperresponsiveness. These two hallmarks can be driven by interactions that TSLP has throughout the inflammatory cascade, impacting multiple downstream pathways and leading to manifestations of severe asthma. There is published data implicating the role of TSLP as a key driver in airway inflammation and an important driver in clinical manifestations of asthma, with associations noted between TSLP and asthma severity, reduced lung function, increased risk of asthma exacerbations, in addition to airway hyperresponsiveness. Knowing the role of downstream mediators like IL-13 and IL-5 and their contributions to airway inflammation and airway hyperresponsiveness is important to understanding the pathophysiology of severe asthma. As discussed in the SARP studies, one manifestation is the development of mucus plugs in the airway, which were present in approximately 68% of patients with severe asthma. These plugs persisted over three years for 82% of the patients who had mucus plugs, showing evidence that they are more common and prominent than originally thought. I hope that you found this overview educational and informative. I will now transition out of the disease state portion of this video and begin the portion of this video where I cover the efficacy, safety, and additional clinical data of Tispire, the first and only treatment for severe asthma that blocks TSLP. Tispire is indicated for the add-on maintenance treatment of adult and pediatric patients aged 12 years and older with severe asthma. Tespire is not indicated for the relief of acute bronchospasm or status asthmaticus. Do not take a Tespire if you have a known hypersensitivity to tezepilumab echo or its excipients. Additional important safety information will be presented later in this video. Tespire was studied in clinical trials enrolling a broad, all-comer patient population. Pathway and navigator studies included multiple severe asthma phenotypes and biomarker profiles. There was also a mechanistic study included called Cascade. The efficacy and safety of Tespire was evaluated in two 52-week pivotal studies called Pathway and Navigator. Pathway and Navigator were randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled exacerbation reduction studies. Collectively, Pathway and Navigator evaluated the efficacy and safety of Tespire in over 1,300 patients with severe asthma. In Pathway, patients had a history of two or more exacerbations requiring systemic corticosteroids or one asthma exacerbation requiring hospitalization over the previous 12 months. While in Navigator, patients had a history of two or more exacerbations requiring systemic corticosteroids or hospitalizations. In Navigator, patients were randomized to receive Tespire 210 milligrams every four weeks, the FDA-approved dose, or placebo by subcutaneous injection. Patients enrolled remained on their background asthma therapy, which included medium or high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and an additional controller medication, with or without oral corticosteroids, for the duration of the studies. The primary endpoint of both Pathway and Navigator was the annualized exacerbation rate. In the Pathway study, there was a 71% reduction in asthma exacerbations, while in the Navigator study, there was a 56% reduction in exacerbations with Tespire compared to placebo. Both of these reductions in exacerbations were statistically significant compared with placebo. In the Navigator study, a reduction in blood eosinophils and exhaled nitric oxide was observed as early as week two and was sustained throughout the duration of the study. Furthermore, Tespire resulted in a progressive reduction in serum total IgE concentration throughout that same time frame. In addition to the clinical information I just reviewed, it may be helpful to provide you with some of the mechanistic data about Tespire. 
it is important to understand that the clinical significance of this data and its impact on asthma has not been definitively established. The CASCADE trial was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled phase two mechanistic study of Tuspire in patients 18 to 75 years old with uncontrolled, moderate to severe asthma. After a screening and run-in period of up to four weeks, patients received their assigned treatment of Tuspire 210 milligrams or placebo every four weeks subcutaneously for 28 to 52 weeks. At the end of treatment, patients entered a 12-week follow-up period. Bronchoscopies were performed at baseline and end of therapy, during which bronchial biopsies were taken for histologic assessment at a central facility. Now let's review an exploratory post hoc analysis from Cascade that evaluated mucus plugging in patients with severe asthma before and after treatment with Tuspire. In the analysis, a reduction of total mucus plug scores were observed in patients receiving Tuspire versus placebo from baseline to the end of treatment. In the population that had a presence of mucus plugs at baseline, a 62% reduction was observed. As mentioned earlier, the clinical significance of this outcome and its impact on asthma have not been established. Results are descriptive only. Here are representative CT images from a subject before and following therapy with Tuspire. As seen in this upper figure, the airway is occluded with a mucus plug. The below figure of the same airway demonstrated clearance of the mucus plug from the airway. The assessment of airway hyperresponsiveness or AHR, was an exploratory outcome that was also evaluated in the Cascade study. The figure shows the change in cumulative dose of inhaled mannitol required to result in a 15% reduction in FEV1, otherwise known as the PD15. Airway hyperresponsiveness, as measured by a response to mannitol, was reduced in patients treated with Tespire versus placebo. The end of treatment mean change from baseline was 197.4 milligrams with Tuspire versus 58.6 milligrams with placebo, indicating a reduction in AHR with Tuspire. Now let's discuss the demonstrated safety profile of Tuspire. The safety of Tuspire was based on the pooled safety population from Pathway and Navigator, which consists of 665 adult and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older with severe asthma who received at least one dose of Tuspire 210 milligrams subcutaneously once every four weeks. Adverse reactions that occurred at an incidence greater than or equal to 3% and more common than in the placebo group from the pooled safety population include pharyngitis, arthralgia, and back pain. Before we summarize the information shared with you today, let's review the important safety information for Tuspire. Hypersensitivity reactions were observed in the clinical trials, example, rash and allergic conjunctivitis, following the administration of Tuspire. Post-marketing cases of anaphylaxis have been reported. These reactions can occur within hours of administration, but in some instances have a delayed onset i.e. days. In the event of a hypersensitivity reaction, consider the benefits and risks for the individual patient to determine whether to continue or discontinue treatment with Tuspire. It is important to know that Tuspire should not be used to treat acute asthma symptoms, acute exacerbations, acute bronchospasm, or status asthmaticus. Do not abruptly discontinue corticosteroids. Dose reductions, if appropriate, should be gradual and may be associated with withdrawal symptoms and or unmask previously controlled conditions. Treat patients with pre-existing helminth infections before starting to spire. If patients become infected while receiving Tuspire and do not respond to anti-helminth treatment, discontinue Tuspire until the infection resolves. Avoid use of live attenuated vaccines. Most common adverse reactions include pharyngitis, arthralgia, and back pain. Now let's highlight some key takeaways from what we've discussed. Tuspire is the first and only biologic to block TSLP. The mechanism of action of Tuspire in asthma has not been definitively established. Patients receiving Tuspire had significant reductions in the annualized asthma exacerbation rate versus placebo in both the Navigator and Pathway trials. 
In Cascade, a mechanistic study, multiple exploratory outcomes were evaluated, such as a post hoc analysis of mucus plugging. Tespire was shown to have an impact on airway inflammation and airway hyperresponsiveness. These results are descriptive only. Based on patients enrolled in Pathway and Navigator, Tespire has a demonstrated safety profile. Thank you for watching this video on the clinical details about Tespire, Tezapilumab Echo. For more information about Tespire, including the full prescribing information, patient information, and instructions for use, I invite you to visit tespirehcp.com or scan the QR code here. Thank you.